Right. So, what I am going to do today is to cover uh, sample size calculation with simple math for continuous outcome. And we know that uh, variability is a universal phenomenon in biology. Unlike in physics uh, or chemistry, there are some constants. There is variability there also, but not as much as it is uh, in biology. And uh, I think biology has the strength that it has variability, but it also is its weakness. So I'm going to ask you questions, uh, and I think uh, Ravi is going to allow you to unmute and answer. Huh? So. My question is, suppose these are height in centimeter of children and they are from two different wards. In ward one, five children who were, whose height was taken came out to be 100 centimeter, 80 centimeter, 60 centimeter, 40 centimeter and 20, 20 centimeter. centimeter. Versus 100 centimeter, 90 centimeter, 80 centimeter, 70 and 60 centimeter. The question is, which is more variable, the first one or the last one? The first one. Sir, the first one. Right. The first one is more variable. And the question is, how to express this variability, right? So that is a problem. Let's take the first one, 180, 60, 40, and 20. And we want to measure this variability and uh, quantify it. So one idea people got was take out the mean of all the values and then differences from the mean, which is also called distance from the mean. So more the distance, wider is the variability. So they started taking a difference, 60 minus 60 is the average. If you add 100 plus 80, 180 plus 60, 240 plus 42, 80 plus 20, 300. 300 divided by five will give you 60 as the mean. And they started taking differences from the mean. So 60 minus 20 is 40, 60 minus 40 is 20. So it becomes 60. The third one is zero, so it remains 60. 60 minus 80 is minus 20, and 60 minus 100 is minus 40, so again it becomes minus 60. So if you add the above, what, what does it become? It comes to, how much does it come to? If you add or uh, do the minus and add all of this, then it, it comes to how much? 40 plus 20 plus zero. zero yes, it comes to zero. So if you follow this advice blindly, then you will say there is zero variability. But that's not that that's not true. There is variability. The problem is coming because there is there are some will be in plus, some will be in minus. So any number of figures you take, if you take out mean and take differences of all the individual numbers from the mean and add it up, you will always get zero. So what is the way out? What to, how to get rid of uh, this uh, phenomena? Because number of pluses, you add the pluses, add the minuses, they are equal. The minuses and pluses are doing the problem. So is there a way to get rid of this uh, Inversal phenomena of getting zero? By making a square. Yes, so making square, very easy. So minus will also become plus, and therefore you can easily add. So it, if, if it is plus 60 and minus 60, both when you square will be 3600, 3600. And if you add, it will be 7200. So that is. That is uh, what uh, one way of measuring the variability. So we can say that variability is 3,600. Uh, but now it is no more in centimeter. 
So if the unit has changed, it has become uh, 6,000, uh, how much did I say? Uh, 7,200, no? 60, yes, 3,600 plus 3,600, 7,200 square centimeters. So that is, that is one way of measuring variability. This is a commonly, uh, met, common method used by statisticians. And the word is not called vari variability, they call it variance. So one way of measuring variability is variance. Variance is nothing but sum of the square of differences from the mean. So of course it will vary from uh, whether there are one groups or two groups, whether you want variance of the two groups or variance of one group accordingly, there will be some modification of the formula, but if there is only one group, then just taking differences and squaring it and adding it up will give you one measure of variability called variance. But the unit changes, you because unit changes, so you have to bring it back to the same unit. If it was centimeter, now it has become square centimeters. So how to get it to the centimeter? By square root. Square root, right. So if you take a square root, that will come to in centimeter. And I'm not going to take a root, but once you take the square root, then it is called standard deviation, right? So standard deviation is one way of measuring the variability. And uh, it is nothing but the square root of the variance or variance is square of standard deviation. Now the problem is that uh, variability is uh, like noise in the system, which we have to either deal with or control it or uh, <clears throat> get rid of it in some way or the other. <clears throat> so that is the whole essence of uh, uh, statistics. Statistics is about dealing with variability finding out signal from the noise. Noise is the variability. Signal in some cases will be difference. Difference may be in the main, main difference. So if there are two groups and the heights of two groups are different, you take out mean of the heights of each group, take out the difference. Difference in the mean is the signal. And the variability which you see is the noise. Since the difference will be in centimeter, uh, which is the signal. If you, are, you have to take signal to noise ratio, then you have to take standard deviation and not the variance because that should also be in centimeter. So this is, uh, you can say, essence of, of tests. They usually see the signal to noise ratio and they try to then argue if there was uh, null hypothesis was true, then what is the probability of seeing this signal to noise ratio as large or more extreme than this? So that is what uh, uh, all the tests do. And that is how we deal with one way of dealing with variability. In fact, when you go further, you will see there are a lot of methods to explain variability. So. If we find differences in the physiology marks of the students, there will be differences. All will not get the same marks. So you have to understand or explain why there is variation. You may start with a number of different uh, methods or methods or explanations which are possible. One explanation is that their IQ is different. Maybe there are differences because of number of hours they study, maybe number of lectures they attend, maybe they, uh, their uh, parents were very uh, high IQ, so they also got high IQ. So many explanations can come to explain the variability in marks of physiology. So that is, that is what we uh, do when we look at predictors of physiology marks, for example. 
So <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is trying to say is that variability is the key and all the time we are trying to either deal with variability or explain the variability. If there was no variability, if everybody had the same height in the universe, we will, we will not need any statistics. If you all the females had the same height, all the males had the same height, and then just measure one female, one male, and see how much is the difference, and you can say whose height is higher. But because there is variation, you have to measure a number of people, find out a measure of variability, see if mean is different, which will be the signal, then take the signal to noise ratio. Now, uh, let us take one example. This was a study published uh, from All India Institute of Medical Sciences on effect of yoga and controlling diabetes. And the way they measure our control of diabetes was HbA1c. So they said, assuming there will be 0.5% mean difference in HbA1c between the intervention and non-intervention, non-intervention group were weight listed for yoga. Then uh, with the combined standard deviation, because there were two groups, intervention group and weight listed group, they took a combined standard deviation, which was 1.5%. And the main difference, they assumed or they hypothesized that maybe half a dip, uh, 0.5 difference, which is uh, expected if they practice yoga. So the question will be, what is the signal in this and what is the noise in this? What is the signal they are trying to detect? And what is the amount of the signal? In this example, anybody? Uh, the signal number. is 0.5% only. 0.5%, absolutely. And what is the noise? 1.5%. Uh, 1.5%, that's right. So if you uh, take a ratio, in this case, difference was 0.5% difference in means, variation, which is standard deviation, was 1.5%. And this is what we call effect size. Effect size in continuous outcomes is difference in means divided by standard deviation. Now, as we talked about two groups, we talked about combined standard deviation. Some, there are uh, different definitions of effect size. Uh, Glass uh, was using standard deviation of the control group. Cohen, Cohen came and said, no, no, we can do, we can take the combined uh, standard deviation which uh, then become Cohen's effect size, which is most commonly used. And it is also called Cohen's D. So Cohen's uh, in continuous outcome, Cohen's uh, effect size definition, which is difference in means divided by standard deviation, standard deviation of the combined, uh, of both the groups combined, is what is uh, called effect size in terms of uh, Cohen's definition. There are uh, there are another definition called Hedges definition. Nobody uses it, so we can forget about it. But most commonly used effect size is Cohen's D. Now this is because we are talking of continuous outcome. If we were talking of dichotomous outcome, then all the things which we talked about, uh, risk difference, risk ratio, odds ratio, hazard ratio, all are measures of effect size. But that is for the dichotomous outcome or continuous outcome, effect size <coughs> is defined as uh, difference in the mean divided by standard deviation in case of Cohen's definition, combined standard deviation. And then Cohen even went to the extent of saying what, what will be large effect size, what can be called moderate effect size, and what can be called small effect size. So if this ratio, that is the signal versus noise ratio, which is, which is called effect size, if it is 0.8, it will be called large effect size. If it is moderate, it is called, uh, if it is 0.5, it is called moderate effect size. If it is 0.2, it 
it is called small effect size. So that's something which you need to remember. We are not talking of risk difference, risk ratio, because these are not dichotomous outcomes. In continuous outcome, when we talk of effect size, these are the ones we are talking about. And when we say statistical significance versus clinical importance, it is the effect size which will tell us clinical importance, uh, not the statistical significance. So that is the that is one of the things you can keep in mind. So now come to sample size calculation, and I want to remind you that it is a rough guide. It is one should not be very stringent about a difference of two or three or four or even ten for that matter. The reason is everybody makes different assumptions when calculating the sample size, it is an estimate. Estimate is a guess. A guess cannot be 100% right. This is why many of the studies have to stop because when interim analysis they find that effect size which they had hypothesized was smaller than actual what they found. So it is showing much more effect and the, the data safety monitoring board may say it is unethical to deprive 50% of patients who are randomized to control group um, not uh, taking intervention. Therefore, we should stop the trial now because we can see there is more than estimated or guessed uh, effect, which is uh, basically very clear and they, they, they're going to stop the trial, which you must be reading. Many trials are stopped early. On the other hand, many trials are uh, actually uh, extended because the effect size which they observe is actually less than what they estimated and therefore they have reason to take more sample size so that uh, they are able to really estimate uh, whether chance can be unlikely factor in what is whatever difference they are observing. So uh, many people uh, have uh, made mistakes. A lot of studies had to be stopped prematurely. Many studies have to be extended beyond what uh, uh, people hypothesized. And many studies uh, resulted in false negative results because they had uh, underestimated the sample size. So sample size estimation is a rough guide. One should not take it. Uh, if you take a uh, few individuals or patients more than you estimate, it is always better rather than taking less. Though you may find that you may have to stop the trial after interim analysis because you have overestimated the sample size. So all these things happen. Like uh, microscope, uh, if you want to detect the small effects, then you have to have high power, which means high sample size, larger sample size, then when you want to detect large effects, which uh, you don't need a very high power microscope, low power microscope will do, which means lower sample size can also do. And it is good to have some prior studies, though it is not always essential, as we were discussing last day. And also it depends on what is your hypothesis. And I told you that there can be different types of hypotheses. For example, if you, if we talk about association between gender and IQ, it generates very good discussion. I told you last time that some people say females have more IQ than males, males have more IQ than females, which is both are superiority hypothesis. Some people will say IQ of males and females is equal, which is equivalence hypothesis. And some people may hypothesize females have no less IQ than males, which will be like non-inferiority hypothesis. So these are the usually, uh, uh, I would say, uh, basis of calculation of sample size, but we are today talking about only the superiority hypothesis. And also remember, we have already dealt with dichotomous outcome. Today we are going to deal with continuous outcome. And I think uh, to understand, uh, I've been going to check whether you understand this very well or not. Uh, let's say, uh, Ravi, can we move this photo is coming in the middle of the slide? Uh, like, if we talk about uh, 
a study which has hypothesis rosy glutathione reduces blood sugar level in diabetes are we talking of continuous outcome or dichotomous outcome Sir, uh, it is a continuous outcome. It will be a continuous outcome, sir. Right. Clopidogrel reduces incidence of myocardial infarction. Is it dichotomous outcome or continuous outcome? Continuous it outcome. is a dichotomous outcome. Dichotomous. Dichotomous outcome because dichotomous. Myocardial infarction may be yes. Myocardial infarction yes. Myocardial infarction no. So that is how you will then then you will have in the numerator. Number of myocardial infarction cases and denominator will be total population. Carotid angioplasty prevents the stroke. Dichotomous or continuous? Dichotomous again. Dichotomous. Dichotomous. Pedipine controls blood pressure. Pedipine controls blood pressure effectively in hypertensive emergency. Which uh, is dichotomous or continuous? Dichotomous. 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 Probably, sir, continuous. Hmm? Continuous. All right. If you measure blood pressure, it will be it down. It is a continuous uh, measurement. Continuous one effect. But if you say effective blood pressure control means such and such level, if you dichotomize that blood pressure, it may you may make it uh, dichotomous. So it all yes. depends on how you want to analyze. Statins yes. control cholesterol level in high risk individuals. What it is it? Continuous. continuous, sir. Continuous, yes, because sure. cholesterol will be like uh, uh, a number. Steroids induce remission in SLE. Remission, sir. Uh, uh, Dichotomous. 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 Amipril improves left ventricular ejection fraction. Dichotomous. Dichotomous. Continuous it is, I think. Ejection fraction can be a numbered. Sir, continuous. Sir. Continuous. Fraction is a number, then it is uh, continuous. If you is say. Percentage? <laughs> yeah, it is percentage, but it is a number. It can be 5%, yes, 6%, sir. 10%. Uh, right. So if you are planning to study uh, improvement of left ventricular ejection fraction using stem cells in patients with acute myocardial infarction, the formula for calculating sample size per group is 16s square by d square. Last time, if you remember, we said 16p into 100 minus p divided by d square. Here it becomes 16s square by d square. S is standard deviation and d is the difference in means. So if you have some data, which is something like this, uh, from previous study, for example, and uh, you see that standard deviation certainly of the change in mean is about 10%. If you see the last uh, change, mean is 3 plus minus 10, 10 is the standard deviation, 5.5 plus minus 10, which is 10 is the standard deviation. Now they found difference in mean, which is 5.5 minus 3, which is 2.5, but if you are hypothesizing that uh, difference will be 5%. So you have you are going to use the different stem cell. You think your stem cells are better. So you need a standard deviation, which from previous study you know is 10%. And so, uh, and difference which you are expecting by use of stem cells between control and uh, experimental group is 5%. Then sample size will be 16s square by d squared. Means 16s is standard deviation, 10%, 16 into 10 into 10, divided by d squared, which is difference, 5 into 5. So it comes to 64 per group. I will give you some exercises, but later on. So that is, this is per group. It is not uh, total sample size. So total sample size, if you have two groups, will be 64 into 2 which will be 128. So <clears throat> that, is, that is what you do. So now you have to see that in this formula, S square by D square, one can even write S by D whole square. So 16, of course, is uh, separate. 
but S by D, both are square, so we can have one square which is covering both. And what is S by D? We discussed just now. What is S by D? S is a standard deviation divided by D is difference. Anybody can see uh, from what we have discussed? We just now discussed something which was uh, uh, relating standard deviation and difference in means. Standard error, sir? No, we didn't discuss a standard error. <laughs> we didn't discuss a standard error. Variance, sir? No, not variance. We we discussed a ratio which we called what? Effect size. Reverse of effect size. Signal to noise ratio. Inverse of effect size. Yeah. That's right. We discussed difference in means divided by standard deviation. We called it effect size. Here it is just uh, numerator is denominator, denominator is numerator. So it is. S by D whole square, not D by S. So it is inverse of effect size, which means it, it is, it tells you that if effect size is less, in other words, you can say 16 into 1 by effect size square, effect size whole square, right? 1 by effect size. So it is inversely related to the effect size. So effect size is more than sample size will be. Less or more? Less. <laughs> Less. Less, sir. Less. If effect size is small, then sample size will be? More. Less. Less, more. sir. It is inversely related. So it will be less. That's right. Sample size. So the question is, if we hypothesize effect size as Cohen's did, small, moderate, and large, then we uh, straight away we can calculate sample size. And this is what has been done in the next slide. You see small effect size, which Cohen's said 0.2 will be obviously 16 into 1 by 0.2 into 1 by 0.2, which will give you uh, 400 uh, patients or subjects per group. So similarly, if it is moderate effect size, then this 16 into moderate, we told you 0.5, so 1 by 0.5 into 1 by 0.5, which means it will be, 16 will be divided twice into half. Six, half of 16 is 8, then half of 8 is 4. So 4 will be the factor, 16 into 4, 64 per group. If it is large effect size, which we said 0.8, then 16 into 1 by 0.8 into 1 by 0.8. So you can imagine you, if you uh, have it uh, uh, calculated, 16 into 2, it will be 32 per group, per group. So in fact, those who are using continuous outcome, they can just hypothesize whether they are expecting small effect size, moderate effect size, or large effect size. And accordingly, have this table ready, 32 per group, 64 per group, or 400 per group. But since people are not clear all the time whether the effect size will be small or moderate or large, so they do calculation based on standard deviation and the difference which, which they expect. So I think we have already talked about this, large is 0 0.8, moderate 0 0.5, small 0.2. Now, if you have and remember, we had said this last time, 16s square by d squared is for power of, this is the same formula like 16p into 100 minus p divided by d squared, but it is for continuous outcome. But uh, you, you remember what was the power of the formula, 16p into 100 minus p divided by 80%. 80%, sir. So power is for 80%. And... Uh, if you remember alpha, alpha was 0 0.05. And uh, based on these two things, uh, we had taken 16. So 80% power and alpha of 5%. Then multiplication factor is 16. And I told you last time, if you want 90% power, 
with same degree of alpha, the multiplication factor will be 21. Remember this. Because many a times people do talk about 90% power, which in which case you have to take the multiplication factor 21 rather than 60. And all the time we have talked about equal uh, sample size in both the groups. If you have unequal sample size, like one group having twice the number, then you have to adjust this uh, as this table suggests. You calculate n, if there is equal number, 1 is to 1, the ratio will be 1, in which case n, n, so 2 n is the total sample size, that is the first row. But if you have twice the number in one group as compared to another, then it will be adjusted like this. Calculate n, but then multiply by 0.75 for the smaller group and 1.5 for the uh, other group. So you can have uh, 1 is to 2. Similarly, 1 is to 3, 1 is to 4, and so on. Now let's take some example now. So you can do some calculation. Please keep your calculator ready. So we have a published randomized control trial in JAMA Internal Medicine. And if you read this, sample size was estimated using results of the only published studies. There was one published study earlier. They based their sample size calculation based on this. They were looking at 80% power, which is very good for our formula and alpha 0 0.05, which is also uh, looking uh, similar to our formula. And now the standard deviation which they have taken is 0.7. You see, uh, you can see, and difference is 0.5. So within bracket, if you see the third line from below, 0.7% is within bracket, which is the standard deviation, and difference of 0.5, which is the difference in mean, uh, HbA1c, and now can you apply the formula and calculate sample size, please? And uh, then uh, we will come whether you have got it right or not. It comes 31.36 as a calculation. So uh, obviously you can't have half of a person. In a so you will say 32 per group, right? That's right. So 16 into 0.7 into 0.7 divided by 0 0.5 into 0 0.5 uh, takes you to 31.36, which means you will round it up to 32 per group. And you see in the study also, they had taken 32 per group. Okay. Right. Now, some studies will adjust for loss to follow up. Loss to follow up is. Suppose you calculated a total sample size of 168 and you estimate that your loss to follow up will be 10%. Which means if you start with 100, you will get follow up of 90. So your data will be complete for 90. But uh, so to have 90, you have to plan for 100. So to have one, you have to plan for 100 by 90. And to have 168, you have to plan for 100 by 90 into 168. So it comes to 187. This is how you adjust for losses to follow up. So adjusted sample size will be 100, per, uh, 100 divided by what percent you think you are likely to follow up multiplied by the sample size which you have calculated. Total sample size, huh? not we denote it by big N, our capital N, not the small N. Small N is per group, big N is total sample size. So this is how you adjust. And this is nothing but simple unitary method. To have 90 at the end, you have to plan for 100 because uh, you have 10% loss to follow. up. So to have 168, you have to have 100 by 90 into 168. So that becomes the formula. So suppose there is 20% follow up, 20% loss to follow up, then how much will be the adjusted sample size? Can you calculate? Suppose you have calculated your requirement is 168, total sample size 168, obviously 84 per group. And you think there will be 20% loss to follow up. So 
what will be the adjusted sample size? Two ten, sir. Two hundred and ten. Two hundred and ten. So let's see. Yes, you are right. And those who did not could not do it, you see, if twenty percent loss to follow up is there, and to have eighty subjects at the end or 80 patients at the end, you have to plan for 100. So to have 160 at the end, you have to plan for 100 by 80 multiplied by 168, which gives you sample size of 210. That's very good. So let's take one example. This is a trial published in the journal Trials, anticoagulation for critically ill patients on mechanical ventilation suffering from COVID-19 called anti co trial and uh, what they have done is we performed the sample size calculation and assumed the data for pi by f ratio according to literature so you see some some study is usually the basis so normally distributed use the mean which would be 160 and a standard deviation 80 so standard deviation is something we need which is 80 then we say that we expect the treatment will improve this by 30%. So 30% of what? 30% of 160. So if you look at the uh, slide lower part, mean is 160, standard deviation is 80. Difference they expect, which is 30% of the mean, which is 160 into 30%. That gives how much? Uh, one, uh, 48. 48, that's right. So now you calculate the sample size and also adjust for 10% dropout. Dropout is also loss to follow up. It's, it's uh, the same. You uh, so please calculate the sample size also and also adjust for 10% loss to follow up. And give me the numbers. 50 is the same. 50. You have to tell me per group or uh, total. Uh, sir, 100 will be the adjusted uh, uh, sample size. Sorry, adjusted is how much? 15 is uh, 100. Sir. Okay, so let's see. This has been done here. 16 into 80 into 80 divided by 48 into 48, 45 per group. 44.4. So you have to round it to 45. With 10% dropout, that will be. 45 divided by uh, uh, 0 0.9, which you have to calculate, and uh, it comes to 51 per group in our this thing. Uh, study has uh, this calculation has been done all by Dr. Amit. So I hope it is right. And so they have also taken, as you can see, we need 44 patients per group, total 88. Taking approximately 10% dropout into account will include 100 patients, which is 50 in each group. So you see, uh, this is this is what you find in published literature also. So the formula 16s square by d square is not far from. Nobody is writing that formula, but uh, you know this is uh, something which works quite well. Then we will take another example, same which I was talking about. And you know that they uh, estimated sample size with uh, <coughs> a dif mean difference of 0.5% and standard deviation of 1.5%. So let us see with our calculation, 16S squared by D squared, what is the sample size per group? And please adjust for 20% loss to follow up. Anybody who gets the answer first, please let me know. 360, sir, total. 142. 360. 142 per group. Okay. 
Without adjustment. Anybody can state clearly please, from calculation. One forty four per group. One forty four per group, sir, without adjustment. Yeah. It is three sixty after adjustment. So it is coming 360 after adjustment. 144 and 180. Right? Is it correct? No. I should do it. It will be 